Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. So we wrapped up the state transition matrix last week, and today, and partially into the lecture that's this afternoon, we will going into the batch estimator and the weighted least squares estimator. And then into weighted least squares with a priori, but instead of me showing you the, def the derivation of that filter, you're going to do that in the homework assignment that's due Friday. So we've got homework due Friday, along with the lecture quiz three due Friday by 5 p.m. The quiz has been posted to D2L, so it's ready for you guys to take a look. Uh, I have not yet confirmed times for the TA to have additional office hours yet this week. We will email those once they are available. But the current plan is for the TA to offer some additional office hours since I will be out of town tomorrow through Friday. So along those lines, we've got one of the makeup lectures this afternoon at 4 o'clock. The Be Boulder Anywhere office needed to change the location. It won't be in here. It will be a couple of doors down in 1B12. So it's still in this hallway, just uh, down the hall. And I don't know yet about lecture 12, uh, the Monday I get back, if that one is going to have a different location or not. I will check on that. And then a quick reminder for those of you who are aerospace graduate students, you should have received an email about this. There is an honor code quiz, which is due in a couple of weeks. They just ask all of us to remind you to do it. And I highly recommend that you do it, mainly because if you don't, you have to write a three to four page paper on ethics, and they're not kidding about that. So you will have to write it, and it will have to be a decent attempt. So it's better to take the quiz and get it done now. All right. So today we're going to go into what is known as the batch estimator. We've kind of assembled the tools so far to start talking about it. Now we're going to put them together. So first, as a quick reminder, we have our linearized equations, where we've got some estimated state x, where because it may be nonlinear, we are going to work with deviation vectors. So we have some deviation vector for our state, little x, at some time, ti. And that is the truth minus our reference, our best guess at the nonlinear trajectory at that time ti. We also have the observation deviation vectors. And those are deviation vectors that represent the difference between the true observation and the observation model that we have based on our nonlinear reference trajectory. So we have a dynamics equation for that deviation vector, which is that x dot equals at times x. Note that we've started dropping that error term for the dynamics, that u term. We'll pick that up again in November. And then we have our observation model, which is the y equals h tilde i xi plus epsilon i, where epsilon i are the observation errors, that we don't know what they are. So the A matrix and the H tilde matrix, in the case of a linearized system, are a set of partials, either the partial of our force model with respect to the state, evaluated at the reference trajectory, or the partial of the observation model with respect to the state, at time ti, evaluated using the reference trajectory. A couple of people are still writing. So we've seen all these before, and the rest of this lecture is primarily going to discuss the batch filter in the context of this linearized form. So we already know that we have this batch estimator, which at a single time, if we have an observation yi, we have the h tilde i from the previous slide and our deviation vector. If we have enough observations, then we can estimate that x i, which we denote by x i hat, given the least squares normal equation that you see here. So it's a straightforward way to estimate the state at a time that matches the observations. And we denote that here by the fact that everything has an i. Everything's at the same time in this formulation. But that's great, but what if we only have, say, range and range rate, and I'm trying to estimate a five-dimensional vector? then we have an underdetermined system. We don't have enough equations for the number of unknowns we have. 
So this gets back to the idea of how do we constrain our estimation problem to generate a state estimate at a single epoch time given a time series of observations. And that's what the batch filter is. So that's starting to answer the question, what about when the observations cover multiple points in time? So we have observations at multiple times. So the big question is, what can we do to estimate the state? Here, the epic state is denoted by the zero. When we have observations at multiple times. So let's say we have these different instances of our observation model. So we have an observation Y1, Y2, all the way down to YL. And if you recall, we have the I equals 1 to L, where L is the number of, number of time epochs that we have. So we have this system of equations. But we want our problem in the form of some y is equal to h x0, where x0 is our epic state, plus the observation errors. So I ask you, what tools do we have available to alter this formulation? What's something that isn't included here that we could add to the formulation that may be able to help us out? So I'll give you a hint. What did we discuss on Friday? What was that? Laplace. That was part of it, but why did we discuss Laplace? The state, the state transition matrix. The state transition matrix, if I have some state transition matrix, Ti, T0, that will map, map some deviation vector X0 to Xi. We haven't leveraged that here at all. And now that I put that up there, some of you may be starting to connect the dots, but we will explicitly state how we're going to use this. So we're going to leverage this in these equations to express it in a form similar to what you see on the bottom left. So how do we do that? So we're going to start with this right here. Oops, wrong way. So we have observation y1 is equal to h1 tilde x1 plus the error at time 1. Then we have it for y2. So we have y2 is equal to h 2 tilde, x2 plus epsilon 2. We're going to take that all the way to that yl. So yl is equal to h l tilde xl plus epsilon l. So if I want to rewrite, say, this first equation in terms of the, my epic state, then I've got my h1 tilde, that remains the same, and I need x1. And if I recall, x1 is equal to the state transition matrix from t0 to t1, x0. So I substitute that right in there. So I get phi t0 to t1 times x0 plus that epsilon 1 error. And then I do that all the way down. <coughs> so that down at the bottom here, I get h tilde l phi tl, or t0 to tl. x0 plus epsilon l. So we've taken all of these observation equations and we now have them in a form that's a function of the epic state that we're attempting to estimate. So if we do that and we start grouping the terms a bit, so now I create one long observation vector, y1, y2, all the way down to yl. <clears throat> and this is an m by 1 
where m is equal to that L times P, where P is the length of each one of those observation vectors. So we have a single column vector. And that is then equal to, we just essentially group everything that we have up here. So we have H1 tilde V from T0 to T1. Whoops. Then H2 tilde V T0 to T2. And then down here we have H tilde L V T0 to TL. So we have this large matrix. And we right multiply it by the epic state X0. And then we have one long observation error vector, which is analogous to what you saw before. So this large matrix here is going to be an M by N. Question? Um, just quickly, conceptually, um, phi is a propagator from T naught to whatever time T I, right? A map, yeah. It's a yeah, so that that's pretty much a, a linear propagator of our state. And then the H is converting that um, state that we have now into an observation. So that's the right. equation of observation from state. For the deviation, yeah. Okay. Yep. And I think that what you're touching upon will be on the next slide where I write this in terms of partials. Okay. And I think it'll, uh, what you're getting at, I think, is exactly what is being illustrated there. Okay. Yeah. And then right here we have a, whoops, not a P. An M by 1. So we've recast this in such a way that we have a large observation vector, Y, is equal to what we will call the H matrix. Note this is not H tilde, it's H. X0 plus some large epsilon vector. So we've rewritten it in this form so that we can use it in the batch, or we can use it in the least squares filter. And when we process all these observations at once, we dub that a batch filter. Question? Why is the matrix with the H tilde and M by N, like, does that mean that the rows are, there are rows for each time and each uh, observation? Effectively. So if we have P observations at L times, and we say that's M, which is right down here, mm -hmm. and we're saying we have one row in this large matrix for each element in that large observation vector. And also a row for each time? You, like it seems like you're going through times and observations. Yes, we are. Row. So we're grouping all times and all observations into one vector. Yeah, but like is each row, like do you have one row that's for one observation at one time, the next row is for the next observation at that same time? Could be if you've got range and range rate. Okay. Yeah. So we're keeping it general, but if you have a P observation, which could have multiple observation types at a single point in time. so. I've got two hands, so Manuel. Um, we're supposing there that all, observ all observation vectors have the same length. For this formulation, yeah. You can make it general to just M, and then you can break it apart, but we're trying to keep it simple right now. Uh, right. The way you wrote the Y and the E vector, is that supposing that L is equal to M, since L is the last element in that vector? That L is equal to M? Yeah, because your last element in Y is YL, not YM. Right, this is being kept in the form P. So each one of these would be a little vector. Oh. Okay. Same with the epsilons if we wanted to Thank you. do that. So previously we had this H tilde, and now we have this H. So on the next slide I'll just describe a little bit more of what is the difference between them. So H tilde I versus H. 
So if we go back, we have this H I tilde, which we have from the definition that it's the partial G X T I with respect to nonlinear state at time T I evaluated using the reference. So that is exactly what H tilde I is. If you recall, state transition matrix from T0 to TI is equal to the partial of the nonlinear state at time TI with respect to the partial at the epoch time evaluated at the reference. So we covered that last week. So in the end, H is a combination of these two. So H, another way of writing it, is that it is the partial of G. <clears throat> Should make that capital. TI with respect to partial X0. Evaluated using the reference. <clears throat> but we don't have those immediately. But in the case of a nonlinear, or the case of a linear system, which is what we're assuming for these linearized filters, we instead write this using the chain rule. So we have the partial G. Oops, don't need the I there. X T I with respect to X I times partial XI with respect to X0. Evaluated using the reference. So you see these two components we have here are quantities we already know. H tilde and that state transition matrix. So we then get Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and write the full. For all i, we get that h1 tilde phi t0 to t1, h2 tilde phi t0 to t2, all the way down to the H tilde L V T0 to TL. Which is the H that we saw previously. Question? So on the last slide as well as this, correct me if I'm wrong, aren't those matrices? <coughs> I don't understand why you're calling them rows. Um, it's block matrix if it's a single row for each one, then yes, it's strictly a row, but it would be a block matrix form where if this is, say, two rows, then that fills the first two rows and the next two rows and so on. Okay. Yeah. So I note that we don't need the star in this case because it's implied because we already have H tilde evaluated using the reference and the state transition matrix evaluated using the reference. Question? Do you mind just really quick what the reference is? The reference is your best guess at the nonlinear trajectory. So you have to do a Taylor series expansion in order to derive what H tilde and the A matrices are. And then you have to evaluate, let's say in the case of the partial derivatives, or it's not the partial derivatives, a numeric propagation of the state transition matrix. Then you need some inputs to evaluate that AT matrix when solving the ODE numerically, right? So that nonlinear trajectory is what you would use to evaluate that. Okay. So whenever you do the linearization problem, you have to linearize about some reference. Yeah. Yep. Question. Uh, I probably missed these, but what's the difference between H and H tilde? The difference between H and H tilde? So the H tilde is the partial of G at some time I. Okay. And then H is the partial with respect to the epoch. But since we can't solve for that, we have to chain rule it. Okay. Yep. 
Um, I think Cody and John, you both raised your hands, right? Yeah, I think Cody had it up first. So I'm a little confused between the deviation vector and the reference. So the reference is updated each iteration. Is that correct? Like when we're we're not there yet. Okay. Yes. <laughs> well, the next lecture will actually put it all together into how we use it for OD. Okay. Yep. John. Why don't you put a sub i on on h without tilde? You can if you're constraining it meaning that if you wanted to create a block of H's, but we're just trying to keep it simple right now. So it's one of those things where as long as you're clear with what your notation is, you'll see different notations used in different papers and different books. But for now, we're trying to keep it clear and say this H in the context of the batch filter is just a grouping of everything that you're going to put into the filter, all the observations, all the information you have for the current arc of data you're processing. Any other questions? Okay, so we have the batch estimator. Where we have some large observation vector. And we're estimating some state at a given epoch. And we have some large H matrix, which is a map of that epoch state to the observations. And then we have the observation errors. So given this form, we can then solve for x0 hat using the least squares filter that you've already seen. Where does our uh, errors go in that case? The least squares is based on the cost function when you're linear linearizing the sum of the squares of those errors. Right. Yeah, so that's where they go. So the j of x, if you recall... I will, we have I equals L, no, not L, 1 to L, and then J equals 1 to P, epsilon I J squared. I just went ahead and roll it, uh, wrote it out for all observations at each epoch instead of re grouping it as a vector here. So in this case, you have a bucket of observations. And in the batch process, you say, I'm going to take all those observations and use all of them in one filter to estimate my state. Now, this is different from those of you who are perhaps familiar with the Kalman filter, which is known as the sequential method. We'll get to that later in the class. But the batch filter, again, is you've got this bucket of observations. You process all of them at once to get a state estimate. <clears throat> so I ask, so I ask, what are some possible shortcomings of this formulation? Benjamin. What if H transpose H is singular? Right. So he's asking, what if H transpose H is singular? In this case, that's very bad for the entire filter. <sighs> We're running into problems because then we have a non-positive definite solution. So uh, singular. Uh, yes. So, what are some other shortcomings in this formulation, Manuel? We are not accounting for individual errors of each measurement. Right. So we are not, say, leveraging any knowledge of the quality of our measurements, right? I mean, every measurement has the same weight in the algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm grouping it all in this one because it encompasses multiple things. So we're not in court leveraging any knowledge of what those observation errors look like. And what's something else that we're not including here? Dylan, you asked me about this earlier. The reference, right? Yeah. So do we have any, aside from using it to compute H, 
Are we including any other knowledge of our reference in this? In other words, what if you have a bad reference or a good reference? Oh. It's not in here, right? <laughs> and we're not, not uh, leveraging any knowledge of the deviation. Or our reference trajectory. Or we're leveraging some knowledge, not leveraging all knowledge of this. So would the would that be the U? The U? Yeah, the U that we're leaving out. Oh, good question. Not yet, no. Um, that would be more um, in leveraging known errors in that F function. So you're right that we're not incorporating that here, but we will get to that later. Right now, these elements right here, let's focus on those because that's what we're going to cover for the rest of this lecture and into the beginning of the next one. So before we get to that, let's look at a quick example least squares problem. So we have some estimated state x that's just some alpha and beta parameter. So let's say alpha and, oops, and beta are constants. So if they're constant, the dynamics is linear. The state transition matrix is identity. So we have an observation model yi is equal to alpha plus beta ti plus epsilon i. Epsilon i is the observation error. <coughs> so we instead write this as a linear system. So you write it as 1 ti times alpha beta plus that epsilon i. So we've just taken the previous and rewritten it in a different form. So this right here, we could solve it via partials, but just by inspection, we see that that is h tilde i. And then right here, we have our state x. So we have it in the form h tilde i x plus epsilon i. So what we want to do is solve for x via least squares. So everything's linear. And we have L observations at ti equals to 1 to L. So we have our h tilde. We want to solve for h. So for that, we would need the h tilde 1 phi t1 t0 all the way down to the h tilde l phi t0 tl. But since everything is a constant here, that state transition matrix is identity. So in this case, we get h tilde 1, h tilde 2, so on and so forth to h tilde L.
because the state transition matrix is identity. And then we have the observations, Y1, Y2, all the way down to YL. So in order to solve this, we need two matrices. We need H transpose times H. And then we need H transpose times Y. We need these for the least squares equation. Once we have these, we can solve for the state. <coughs> Question. The second line, is it uh, H tilde or H or just H? What do you think? I think it's H. You think it's H? Uh, because we have there uh, H tilde times X. Right. But it's, is it X? We have obs different observations at different times. Now it's clouded by the fact that we have a state transition matrix that's identity. So the full H is all of these H tildes put together. But this is the single H tilde for a single point in time TI. So first, let's see, Oops. so remember that we have the H tilde I is equal to 1 Ti, and that's just stated right above, or comes from right above. So when we do our H transpose H, we get 1 over T1 not over, 1 T1, 1 T2, 1 TL, and then 1 T1, 1 T2, 1 TL. So this is just taking the H from the previous slide and writing it out. So when we do this, we can actually write this, in this case, as a function of L. So the top row times the first column just gives us L. The top right would just be the sum over Ti, and the bottom left would be the sum over Ti. And that's just by taking say the top row multiplied by the second column, etc. And then the last element would be the sum over ti squared. So that would be all these t's times essentially themselves. So we take that H transpose and write it again. So we have the H transpose portion. Then our observations are just Y1, Y2, through YL. So when we solve that one, again, we get a nice simple form, which is the sum over yi, and then the sum over yi ti. So we have our two matrices. So then we can plug it in if we wanted to, if we had observations. And we have h transpose times h, x hat is equal to the h transpose times y. And this would give us X hat. Once we actually had times and values for those observations. So then you solve that for your state at the times of your observations. Uh, in, in the case of the batch filter, at the epoch time. But okay. it's a little, since they're constants here, it doesn't change over time. Okay. Yeah. 
So in this case, we have a nice, clean form. So something to introduce in terms of notation, or a more nomenclature. This is also known as the information matrix. And this is known as the normal matrix. And there are reasons for it that will be clear later on in the class, but we want to start introducing the jargon early. So in this case, we have a nice clean expression for how to solve these two. Okay. So now, let's take that previous example and say L is equal to 3. TI is equal to 1 two, and three. Then our observations equal four, five, and six. So we then ask, what is our state? So we take all this information and we plug it into the equations we had previously. So if we go ahead and take the inverse of the information matrix, or we do it, use it in that form, you plug in the numbers and you get 3, 6, 6, and 14 for the information matrix, which we're going to invert. And then... For the normal matrix, you get 15 and 32. So once you invert that information matrix, it's 7 thirds, minus 1, minus 1, and 1 half. And then 15 and 32. That's which would give us 3 and 1. So that gives us the estimate for that alpha and beta parameter that we're attempting to solve for. Question? This is our initial state that we're solving for, right? Say it again, sorry. This is our initial state? Uh, yes. <coughs> or x, like 1? Is that what we're solving for? Since it's constant, it's ambiguous, but to be complete, we'll just put the zero there. Oh, okay. Yeah, because the constant's the same at every point in time. For this case. Okay. Yep. So when you generated these, uh, this series of observations, uh, I'm assuming you took epsilon equals zero? Good question. And that leads into the next thing we would look at for the filter. Did I do that to generate the numbers? Yes. Let's pretend I didn't for a moment. So then we ask, what are our observation errors? What does this tell us about how well we're doing in terms of fitting to the data? So if you recall, this is equal to y minus h x. So what we want is an estimate of how well we fit to the data. So we want some epsilon hat. And these are known as the post-fit residuals. So we know through the least squares, if we did everything correctly, we should be minimizing these. But we don't necessarily know that they're equal to zero. So whenever we run those through, we have the 4, 5, and 6 for the observations. Then we have the H matrix, 1, 1, 1, 2, and 1, 3, times our X hat. In that case, that gives us zeros, even though the last one looks a bit like a 6. 
So in this case, we look at it and say, well, we got an estimate that fits very well to the data. It gives us some confidence in the quality of our solution. If these were very large, then we may say, well, maybe I don't trust this solution. But then that begs the question of what is very large. It may be that these so-called large numbers that we're seeing are, in fact, just fine based on the performance of our sensor. So that gets into more of what Manuel was starting to get at, which is leveraging knowledge of the performance of our sensor and how much we would weigh these observations. So we have the batch estimator. So we've recast everything to estimate a state at some epic time. And we use the least squares filter that we've already seen. And we just group everything in terms of one large observation vector, the H matrix, and then the observation error vector, epsilon. And we process all observations over a given span in a single batch. <coughs> so we mentioned some shortcomings. We have no weighing of the observations. So we ask, how do we account for different sensors with different accuracies? Or even a sensor that gives us better range measurements than range rate or vice versa. And we have no incorporation of previous information. And this is known as a priori state information. And we'll have a definition of that whenever we start talking about the a priori least squares filter. And that asks the question, how do we include this in the filter? So first, the weighted least squares estimator. So before we jump into that, are there any lingering questions on the basic batch filter? Okay. So let's say for each observation, yi, we have some weight, wi. And we just group those into a diagonal matrix with zeros in the off diagonal. So each observation has some weight, W1 through Wm. And Wi is greater than 0. If you set weights negative or equal to 0, you run into problems. So we constrain it such that all the observations are greater than 0. So when we do that, we rewrite the least squares cost function in terms of that large observation error deviation vector and the weights. So we have that epsilon transpose times W times epsilon. So we've introduced the weights through this formulation. So when we substitute in the Y minus HX zero for the epsilon, we get at least squares cost function of this form. Question? Is there a constraint on the, the sum of the weights, like uh, the sum from 1 to, to m of wi is equal to 1 or something like that. Is there any reason we'd want to do that? No, that will just give you a, I mean, a coefficient multiplying the cost function. So. Right, right. So no, we're not doing any, say, the sum of all the weights equals 1 or 2 or anything like that. Are there cases where you would want to have, you know, one of the weights be 0? If you do have one of the weights zero, your filter is going to break. Now, that then begs the question of what if you really don't trust an observation? And the argument there is don't include it. <laughs> That's the easiest thing. But if you set it equal to zero, for reasons you'll see in the derivation, this becomes a non-positive definite matrix, which means your information matrix is non-positive definite, and you can't do it. Gotcha. Yep. So you can't just set it to be zero if you... Nope. The best you could do is set it to be very, very, very small. Okay. Now, your computer may have problems in that case, but mathematically, it's not, it would be okay. Yeah. Yeah. But then it'd be close to singular, right? It'd be close to, yeah. And that's where the no, numerics no. versus the actual result would it's come just in. weight the other ones bigger and make that one smaller? Well, it's a, we'll get into this in November. It's a relative magnitude thing. Uh -huh. Yeah. If, say, W1 is 10 to the 20 and WM is 10 to the minus 20, Effectively, that 10 to the minus 20 is 0 compared to the other one in terms of finite precision computing. So we'll cover that more later on, but you start to run into problems there. And in fact, we have a homework where you deal in that numeric error regime. 
Okay, so we ask, what are, what are the effects that these weights have on this cost function? So I've just written it out in a different form here for the sake of discussion. So let's consider the case with two observations. So M is equal to 2. So let's say weight 1 is equal to 1, and weight 2 is equal to 2. So we have the two observations. This would then give us a cost function Jx equal to epsilon 1 squared plus 2 epsilon 2 squared. And that's just substituting the weights from the equation above. So we have this case where omega 2 is equal to 2 and omega 1 is equal to 1. So which epsilon i will have a larger influence on this cost function? And why? The second one? So it will what? It will have a larger influence on Jx? Depends how big epsilon 1 and 2 are, but... Right. Yeah. Comparable magnitude, then yes. Right. But the idea is that since this 2 is twice as large as this 1, then we're tr trusting it conceptually twice as much. Now, we'll have an example later on that shows what happens in the filter, but before we get to that, just in the context of the cost function, let's say we have some x hat that would give us epsilon 1 equals epsilon 2, which is equal to 1. That would give us some cost function result equal to 3. But if we have some epsilon hat, I'll just denote it as prime to differentiate it, which gives us epsilon 1 equals 0, and epsilon 2 equal to 1. Cost function would equal 2 in that case. And finally, epsilon, or x hat double prime, epsilon 1 equals 1, and epsilon 2 is equal to 0. That would give us a cost function Jx is equal to 1. So in that case, out of these three candidates, based on this cost function, this is the best solution. It's the one that gives us the lowest value of that cost function. And we saw that when we choose between decreasing epsilon 1 to 0 versus epsilon 2 to 0, we get the largest imp improvement with epsilon 2 because it's weighted twice as much. So I guess that tells you which sensors you need to work on more? Yeah, that's one thing that it does. Uh, and in fact, uh, when we get to the statistics later on, we'll talk about more about how to generate these weights and what the significance of those weights could mean. So where are we on time? So we will try to minimize epsilon 2, right? Sorry, what was that? We'll try to minimize. We'll try to minimize epsilon 2. Well, the least squares cost function is to minimize the sum of these epsilon values. Uh, yes, of course, but when solving, we'll, uh, as the weight is uh, much bigger than, the weight of epsilon 2 is much bigger than epsilon 1. Oh, in this specific case, yeah. Effectively, you would try to minimize epsilon 2 as much as you can, and then you would try to gain on epsilon 1. Conceptually, is what would be happening. Okay, so the first thing we'll start with this afternoon when we return at 4 is the derivation of the weighted least squares estimator. So with that, um, hopefully see some of you this afternoon. And that's at 4, right? That's at 4, yes. And I'll send an email out with the new location. I know. For now, yes.